propagate the gospel of redemption to enlighten our people on various development. So I want to thank you <coughs> who just joined us. And I want to say you are welcome once again on this evening, sir. Uh, you know, discussion or program. So we are looking at uh, a very wonderful approach of Mazen Namdekanu that is really, really, really worth acknowledging. You know, very, very important. And it's important to also confirm from you if you're getting us loud and clear. Um, if you're getting us loud and clear, and also very, very important to share this program this evening, because we are going to look at a very wonderful strategy that is really, really destroying, or should I say, leading to deliverance of a lot of people in Nigeria. Very, very important. Because if you understand, <clears throat> if you understand a problem, then there is every possibility that that problem is half solved. And that is exactly what we are going to look at this evening, the surgical, what I titled uh, the surgical operation of Mazen Namdekanu that unmask the insidious Fulani actors in Nigeria. Very, very important. And that begin, we begin from this submission that Fulanese have been very powerful people. We must admit that. They have been so powerful not because they have high IQ than other ethnic or ethnic, uh, ethnic compositions you see in Nigeria. No, they are not powerful because of that. Not because they have the highest IQ, because if they do, they would have been the highest producers of professors, doctors, engineers, and all this, which they are lagging seriously behind. But one thing that makes them powerful is the ability to operate under the process, under process, I will explain what that entails. The Fulanis understand the demographic weakness they have. I'm talking about population or population not disadvantageous. They are. They understand that when it comes to population, they don't have an edge, they don't have a comparative advantage than others. In fact, when you look at Nigeria demography, they are one of the least in terms of demography. I'm talking about the Fulani population. But one thing that makes them so strong is the ability to wear the face of the people they want to control but their minds. And this is a very powerful tactic. Any person or an individual, a group of individuals that develop a very special craft of working with prosy, invariably 
makes a long headway in whatever he or she is pursuing. And that is one thing the Fulanis really have mastery over. I repeat, they have mastery on working with proses. You know, if they want to influence your community, they don't believe in coming to your community directly. What they do is they get an indigenous person brainwash him or her subjugate him demote him mentally from his unique personality to servitude they make him to understand the importance of serving them either economic importance or political importance this is what they do they make the people they in fact they try as much as possible to instigate to create a, 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 you know to create an atmosphere of competition among the indigenous population on whom should serve the full and is better in order to have positions and it's a very it's a very wonderful way we must acknowledge that it is a very wonderful technique on their own side. Because they understand that if they come directly, definitely they are going to face rebellion. They are going to face opposition. So what they do to their own advantage, and we must give them credit for that is to create or duplicate a lot of servants in the targeted population they raise a stooge they raise a prosy and they start working on the people through the prosy they raise and that's why they successfully conquered the Nigerian people. I repeat, they successfully conquered the Nigerian population, not by their own direct appearance. It was of recent they started showing up the identity because they felt that they have consolidated. But before now, the Fulanese have been penetrating the rest of Nigerians with either they use a slogan, Arewa. And you know, when you hear Arewa, it comprises Christian North, Christian Northerners, Hausa Northerners, Birom Northerners, down to Otoba, just close to Otobo. They gathered all this wonderful population and they christen them arewa under one arewa umbrella so when you now hear that arewa has taken position against odudua or against the biafran population you now assumed that it's just the wish of the generality of those ethnic and tribes that made up the so-called arewa you don't understand that it is basically Fulani's agenda being projected under a pseudo name, Arewa or Arewanism. This is exactly what people never knew. The civil war was more of Fulani intention. To deal with the Biafran population, but they did that under the Arewa project. In fact, they used a man who is regretting his role, General Gowon. They used a man who, would, in his normal sense, in his ideal sense, would never subscribe to committing genocide. But they used him because. 
they discovered at that very time his hunger for power. He wants to take that seat. They stay away for the seat, just for him to sit ceremonially. Why at the background? They control what he did. And that's why immediately that moment expired, got over. He was removed. In fact, he was on meeting, I think AU meeting. And he was removed. So it has really been a very, very tactical approach, very deep methodology that the Fulani population have used on the rest of the Nigerians. And what is that status? It is called the Titus of Prozy, engaging with Prozy via Prozy, fighting via Prozy. And it really worked for them. But today, the major problem they are facing is this very fact that that antis, that approach is really, really unmasked. Somebody has taken it as a responsibility. You know, when we talk about the wisdom at Mazenam de Kanu's disposal, is really, really not comparable among the black race. We do respect with whatever you might think. On the contrary, the truth remains that his surgical operation of identifying, you know, it, it just like in the midst of crowd, you were able to pick out the super individual that controls the generality of that crowd. And that is exactly what he did. What Mazen Namdekanu did was he looked at the entire population, he looked at the Nigerian society and discovered that apart from the Fulani population or the, uh, the ruling class, that the rest of Nigerian population are unconsciously doing what they are doing. They do what they are, what they are doing, not with their own consciousness. I repeat. Mazen Namdekanu looked at the generality of Nigerian population and discovered that apart from the Fulani population, the rest of Nigerian population are unconscious of what they do. I will explain to you. None of them understand what they are doing. Whether you call them ex president, whether you call them, it is the only Fulani ruling Ellis that are conscious of everything that is happening. The rest of Nigerians, whether you call them Ellis, whatever classification you would, social classification or political classification you would love to uh, you know, allocate to them, that is your own business. But the truth remains that they were not conscious. They never knew what they were doing. Go on as, you know, was used to commit genocide and he never even knew the gravity of what he was doing so like the lines of Obasanjo you know one thing they, they never understand was the or sorry they never understood is this they failed to understand that the more they were advancing for one Nigerian project, the more they are consolidating the Fulani estate. From Gowon, in fact, from Zik, if we should go down land history, from Zik down to Gowon, even to the point of agreeance. Go on, Obasanja and all the rest of them. They we are not aware that some 
set up people we are the background and regulating them unconsciously it was of recent and we must we must give the, that credit to Mazen and Bikam, that some of them began to realize their mistakes that you can hear the lies of go on feeling sorry for his actions you understand me so in such a situation or such in such situation it will be so difficult for you to profile a resounding solution because you are seeing a crowd who don't know who was controlling them you are seeing a crowd acting a script written by unseen structure because the titles of the school and have been they just be at the background be at the base then get somebody who might not even be a full army at the mainstream then in secret at night they hand over a script that he must execute do you understand me so they use that to catch the generality of Nigerian population. The Hausa man thinks he's advising Hausa cause only to realize he was used to advance Fulanization. Same to be Roman. Same to whether you call yourself Niger Delta. Same to even Southwest. And even same to some of your Eastern leaders. They were just proses. So in such difficult situation, because you are seeing someone that looks like you, that speaks the same language with you, that worship the same God with you, but all he's showing up are a hostile behaviors, non-pro your domestic policies you see him he speaks the same language he bears your name but each time he he he's marshalling our policies you now discover that it looks as if he even love those who are oppressing your people than you and sometimes some of us we feel like hitting our heads on the wall the truth remains that those set of individuals are just proceeds some of them, in fact, majority of them, are acting the script handed over to them. So, the Fulani population or the Erulin Ellis successfully consolidated on that. They successfully achieved that ideology, that concept of using the people's brother to achieve their end and they went at the background in fact those days if you ask them they tell you they are Hausa they first of all bring Hausa Fulani they don't say Fulani Hausa they bring Hausa Fulani making you to see Hausa man first as your problem not even Fulani in fact at the time People were seeing that the problem coming from north were Hausa problem. Nobody was noticing the Fulani at the background, but they were using the mask of the Hausas to offend others. So, what happened? In such circumstances, it takes one careful observation to identify such an insidious character. Two, it takes boldness to identify him also. So what Nandekanu did that is really, really getting them pissed off today is that he was able to separate 
the key problem by letting the rest of Nigerians to understand this is not how someone's problem. It's not how someone that is causing the problem. The kidnappings, the banditry, the terrorism, it's not even the Osama. Rather, it is the initiative of the Fulani. And because he consistently was preaching that, and the Fulani is on their own side, we are consistently showing evidence that what he was saying are truth. And people began to open their eyes now. Yes, people began to identify the key problem of Nigeria. You know, before now, people used to say, Igbo, we are the, the campaign the sinful and people carried against the Igbo nation. That they were so competitive, they were so violent in terms of economy, uh, economic pursuit and all this. But as it stands today, the rest of Nigerians have identified their slave masters, or should I say, a second slave masters of theirs, apart from Britain. And unfortunately also, to the Fulani powerhouse, we are now having a set of Fulani. You know, when you look at the Fulani political structure or power, uh, control system, you will discover that there are basically two ideological lines. When you look at, if you make a critical observation of um, the Fulani powerhouse, you find that there are two ideological lines. There are conservative Fulanis, there are liberal Fulanis. There are Fulanis who believe, there are those of them in school of thought who believe that even though they need to consolidate in their internal colonialism on the rest of Nigeria, that they should do that without violence. There are Fulanis on that school of thought. They believe they don't need to keep creating problems, killing people and all this, but yet yeah, they can control other Pass of Nigeria by imposing through prosy, not through troublemaker. And those of them you see within this ideological line, if you look at Atiku, if you look at um, Abubakar, former president, if you look at um, very many of them, these are individuals who believe. They are liberal thinkers. They are liberal Fulanis. They believe that they can make you economically in your land, then empower you to emerge as a political leader. Then because you're a political leader, you will always give them access to whatever they want in your land. These are, these are liberal or let me say progressive Fulanis who believe in soft approach of colonizing others. They believe even though they need that, they have to do that with soft approach. Raising people within your own localities, empower them to emerge on the political space and the economic spaces, then have them doing their bidings. Now, there are another ideological lines, or an ideological class, so to say, of Fulanis. These are arrogant, extremely arrogant Fulani population or class. They believe that they have penetrated a lot. They believe that they have, you know, networked enough that either you give them access or they take it by force. 
these are the conservatives so their mentality is they don't need to beg you for anything that they have all the missionaries of the government at their disposal they have the dss to intimidate you and harass you they have the army to bully you they have the police they have the judiciary so they believe that they should have whatever they want in your land not minding how you feel and why time and time we are going the conservative Fulanis took over from the progressive Fulanis. Currently, the people who are in charge of Nigeria are the conservative, or should I say the orthodox Fulanis, those who believe in Usman Danfodio's approach. Yes. Because like I said, there are two ideological lines. The, the progressive and the conservative. Fulanis. And like I told us, I said, the progressive Fulanis believe they have to build what we call web of connections. Web of connection. And that web of connection is just like um i wish i can draw a sketch here uh, it's just triangular in shape something like this let me let me let me um let me do something here uh, there are two kinds of the fulanis which we are we talk the conservative and the liberal now look at this now I wish you can see it well. If you watch this very well, at the base here, I'm just trying to do some sketches here. At the base of the triangle is the liberal Fulanis. Look at how they believe. The liberal Fulanis believe that they should be at the base. Then have other indigenous populations scattered at the peak. But what is important to them is that they are in control of the base. They don't mind who, who is at the peak. But what they are after is let them control the base, then scatter other non Fulanis. You know, in their own lands. So what they do is that, this day, I'm talking about two kinds of ideological schools within the Fulani class. Now, this liberal Fulanis, I told you, is the likes of At Atiku Abubakar. It is the likes of Abu Salam Abubakar. It is the likes of Dangote. And uh, some of them, they are exposed. Most of them got educated in Western schools. They are somehow in businesses. So, social interaction have really cleaned them up because they have interacted they have mixed up they have blended as a result of economic engagements and political engagements educational engagements so these guys yes they have the conquest conquistados mentality they have the mentality of the conquistador but they believe and these are the ones britain loves so much these are the ones Britain would want them to be on power. But unfortunately, they are not the ones on power. That's why Britain is somehow skeptical about supporting the current government. So these ones believe that though they are rich, though they are influential, but they have to take whatever they want in any society, any targeted environment, through process. So what they do is that if they come to East, for instance, they empower a lot of people. You know, they make a lot of Easterners, for instance, they make them oil magnets, make them 
to be connected, to be wealthy in terms of business, because they made those guys, the loyalty of those guys is 100% to them. So anything they want from the East, say for instance, if they want a land, they don't even need to buy the land with their name. They are Eastern boy, we buy the land in his name and allow them run it. So you understand, there is a one common factor between the or Libra. They all want to rule. They want to rule, want to rule others. But they have different methodologies or approach of achieve, approaches of achieving that. The Libras believe you don't need to kill, but you have to empower people in various lands and have them do your will. And they successfully build these networks. And Britain enjoys the Libra Fulanese because they understand the politics of divide and rule. They understand the politics of the politics of indirect rule, rulership. Whereby you rule the people indirectly, they will never, never see you at the gallery. Now, but on the contrary, the conservative Fulanese are not happy with these liberals. The reason being that these liberal Fulanese, because of their level of education and exposure, they are not orthodox Muslims. They are not fanatical about Islam. I think you can understand. They are not fanatical about Islam. Islam to them is not a do or die affair. Because they have been exposed with Western culture. They club, they meet up with Western women. So they are not religious oriented. So the conservatives always see them as semi-infidels. That they don't know anything much. So these guys who are liberals believe in as much as their business is involved, they should play a very careful politics. And that was why the problem began that the conservative decide to remove these liberals on the way and enter into the government. And one of the conservatives are the likes of Brad Erofine and all the rest of them. These are religiously inclined Fulanese. They are conservatives. They don't believe on pacifist approach. They believe that you, they must get what they want. And they are more Usmanda oriented. And this is where we are today. They are the ones in charge. And because they are in charge, they believe they will get everything they want by almost at all costs. They don't care how you feel. So why the liberal Fulanis believe they have to talk to the Eastern governor and appeal to them and say, why not do this? Considering that I was assisted you, the conservatives call the Eastern governors with threats. They call them and tell them, if you don't do this, we we'll give you wahala. They don't believe in uh, simple or pacifist approach. And that is where Britain is fed up with the conservatives. Because Britain had been expecting them. Let me tell you, Britain understands that any day Fulanis are fully unmasked as the propellers in Nigeria. Any day the rest of non Fulanese population understand this, that that the Nigeria will end. And that's why today 
If you hear Mazen Namdekan specialize in concentrating fully, letting Nigerians to understand that their problem is the Fulanis. They are the ones who are the cause of the economic wreckage. They are the ones who are the cause of insecurity. Now that everybody's eyes, people are beginning to put attention to critically observe what this young man is saying. Let's see if they are ones. And do you see the newspaper platforms are beginning to see things the way it ought to be. Formerly, kidnappings, you're seeing terrorism. The newspaper would have been writing Hausa men or Hausa boys. But they are now identifying the key problem. And who did that? Is it not the gun? Was it a, a, a smooth journey? Absolutely no. Because for you to achieve that, you must to remain stubborn. Yes, you must remain stubborn. Because people you are battling with are in control of their resources. So they don't mind to empty the treasury just to buy you off. That's why I sometimes when people take, talk, I in my own in my own private space or private time, I I always say people don't understand how much in them they must have survived a lot of things. Yes. People don't understand because he was bribed beyond measure and he stood against it. He was offered a lot of things and he stood against it. Because remember, the approach, the common approach that is common in Asura is bribing. They bribe you out of conscience. They bribe you out of your vision. And if that fails, they intimidate and harass you out of conscience and vision. That is just, that is just the key. Up. They hate mental engagement. They hate argument. It depends them. They hate mental engagement. And that's why ask yourself a simple question. If you call a meeting, a conference for mental brainstorming, the next thing you hear is that they have walked out from the conference. They did that in 2014 National Conference. They walked out. If you call for restructuring, they walk out from any debate on that. If you call for argument or referendum, they will definitely work out. That is just the way it is. Because they understand nothing else than offering of bribe and intimidation. That's just the two keys. If you deny them such access, they fizzle out naturally. If they offer you bribe, you refuse. If they activate state threat, you survive it. You just watch them <laughs> disappearing before your own sight. You see them melting out like mirage. So what are we talking about? So the ability of an American to identify the problem, the key problem, and mention the name. Do you understand me? His ability to identify the problem. And what is that problem? That the arrogancy of the Fulani class is not going to help matters. His ability to identify it. 
Okay, take for instance the recent comment, uh, right of Mazenam the Kanu, which Vanguard and so many newspapers has lifted up. How could Mieti Allah, according to the aid of Kasina State Government, kidnap secondary school children? And Mieti Allah also facilitate stood on the negotiation. And guess what? And nobody cares to proscribe Mieti Allah except the international organization. Local organizations refuse outright. The federal government refused. And these members of this group that are, that are notorious for kidnapping and banditry, terrorism also, have access to the government of the day. How do you even justify that? How do you justify that? Okay, let's say Mieti Allah is a responsible group, so to say. Now, another question you have to ask them. If they are responsible and they think for the well-being of the Northerners, as they have alleged, why is it that the security network they, pro, uh, they, they, they set up, according to what they promised some time ago, why is it that security network have not been able to secure northern nigeria it's another question why is it so that the security network has not been able to secure the entire net? And nobody cares to ask. So you understand what we are talking about. You understand the basis at which the world is looking at Nigeria. You know, people should understand that as far as international relations is concerned, there is no permanent friend, there is no permanent enemy, what you have is permanency in interest. People don't understand that. Britain would not want, listen, Britain would not want to identify with a group of people that are causing nuisance in her former colony. Britain cannot want that. Britain would not also want to identify with a group that the rest of Nigerians are seen as their problem. Britain would not want that. So, and I think the most challenge Britain is facing now is how do they turn the excessiveness of this conservative Ask yourself some questions. That is just, but unfortunately, to Britain also, the child they want to them has already run to, should I say, a more bigger nation. Yes, you know, most, most of people don't understand that. The liberal Fulanese, the liberal Fulanese always listen to Britain. They want to listen to Britain because of their, their, their degree of exposure. But the conservative Fulanese, as I speak to you, have abandoned even Britain and ran to China. Because all they want to hear is how best. they can nationalize their brutality culture. So they don't want to go to a country that will be advising them, Britain that will be advising them about human rights, respect for self-determination. They don't want that. They don't want to run to a country that will start telling them about civil society organizations and the respect to the place of international NGOs. They don't want it. 
They want a country that will tell them how to make APC to be like a communist party of China. And they abandoned Britain. And it also is a headache to Britain on how to manage the issue. And Britain does not know how to go about it. And as I can see, it looks as if Britain is in a very serious diplomatic crossroad as far as Nigeria Britain relationship is concerned. It's a very serious concern to Great Britain because imagine having a group of people who decided to go their way who decided to violate the commonwealth culture and way of doing things so is it also a concern to britain so what are we trying to say ability of identifying and the mainstreaming this very fact that the problem the Nigerian people are facing is as a result of the administrative failure of the Fulani class. Yes. It's a wonderful identification. Master Namdekan did a not enough job on that. And his work commended. But finally, before we come to the end of today's discussion, or um, should I say, program, we should also understand, as it currently stands now, the unity of Nigeria is in a very big mess. In a very big mess. And the international community are also watching they are also watching. I understand, this is my personal submission, I'm not telling you any such. I understand that based on things that had happened in other countries, I understand the plans of international community might be in consensus to stop this government from, from uh, in further destructions, which they can do. I tell you, it's a personal submission because I've seen it in several countries, which they can do by instigating overthrow by the army. Because sometimes we read uh, Buratai, chief of army staff, one you know, won the, the military officers against plotting for Q. We have seen cases where international community, I can point to references to you, we have seen cases where international communities rally around to remove a, you know, remove a government because they are posing a very strong risk. The world mind, though it is undemocratic, but sometimes the world goes against her way just to make sure peace and security is assured. If that is not achieved, another thing I believe they might equally be thinking of, because make, make no mistake, what is happening in Nigeria is not in any way of interest for Britain or the Western world. Yes, they understand that it's not at their own interest. In fact, it is an embarrassment to Britain and other players. So, another thing, another thing I feel my quality, what they might think, is to support different components. 
for peaceful dissolution. Yes, for peaceful dissolution. And I believe it's likely going to be the option. Because ideologically, it is practically incompatible. To see the violent North staying together with relatively peaceful, loving South. In fact, people are, people are beginning to realize the inevitability of it, of staying together of these two devices. And of course, when I talk about violence, not remember, Middle Belt is excluded. And people are beginning to get fed up with the union. And you must also understand that what was a country united is not few numbers of individuals who call themselves politicians. What holds country together is the common citizens. Immediately, the common citizens delink, disassociate, disassociate themselves mentally from a union. That country just existing, not living. And that's exactly how things are in Nigeria. Over 200 million of Nigerians are already detached from the union. They are just, they are just here because nobody could offer them evacuation aircraft or evacuation ship. Anchor an evacuation ship in Bonisi or Tinka Island, Lagos. Nigerians will empty themselves voluntarily. Even tell them that this ship is going to be the second Jesus. You know, the ship that was used for slave trade, one of them is Jesus. So tell them that this is the ship for transatlantic slave. Believe you me, Nigerian populations will willingly submit. So when people are already detached from an entity, that country becomes an aberration. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. Nigeria as it is, is an aberration. It's now a geographical expression. Because people are not committed to the union with their hearts. And of course, it's so embarrassing that there is absolutely nothing the country has done for anyone. Absolutely nothing. They refuse to give you electricity. You go and buy your gen. When they discover you have buy, uh, if you've gotten a gen, they keep increasing the price of the gasoline. They deny you electricity. You bought gen. They increase fuel in order to punish you for providing electricity for yourself. You understand? And of course, they deny you motorable roads. Not just denying you motorable roads, and even tolerated insecurity on those roads. You can hear how people are being kidnapped on a daily basis. First class monarch in uh, it, uh, was Kogi State was kidnapped in the mosque. And we are hearing that more kids were kidnapped in Casino after the boys were released. So, 
in such a society, people are already detached out of it. There is mental disassociations from such society. And if anybody tells you Nigeria is united or Nigeria is a country, that person is joking. Because what keeps a country is the level of love the people have for that country. Yes. But we are in a country that people is still lose. The government prefers to even pay the so-called repented terrorists hugely than the military personnel, than the police officers, than members of other paramilitaries. The government is in a haste to pay for ransom of the so-called kidnap kids. But the same government have been close to one year arguing with ASU, shutting down the entire learning centers. But in a haste, to pay money to members of Mieti Al to release the boy. Of course, millions of dollars. But could not pay little demise by ASU. Do you understand, Do you understand the country <laughs> you are? So you can now understand the country you are. So it's really, really terrible, disgusting. And people, although people who, who have that mental ability to think, always ask this question, this simple question. If this is happening this way today, what is the fate of children on board if they should remain in such country? You know, we uh, today is Sunday, and I believe some persons who went to church got a lot of deceptive messages and brainwashing. Yes, I know what I'm talking about. Deceptive messages. The Nigeria will be good someday. This one will be. And you keep asking them, this same thing people have been talking for donkeys of the years. There is no, you don't, man, for your information, for those of us, especially the, you know, those of them in the religious circle, for your information, there is no street of Israel. I think Chaspaka is here listening to us from Israel. There is no street of Israel that is built by Israel, as in what that was built for Israel by angels. Absolutely no. Angels have never built a city for Israel in their most loving place in the heart of God. So when people believe on illusion, or that they man, it shall be well. Who told you that mere proclamation fixes a nation? No, it doesn't. What fixes a nation is human impulse, not illusions, not fantasies, and of course, not mere wishes. That is just the way it is. So when you understand what we are talking about, then you start pitying for yourself. You start pitying for yourself. Because the country is not ready to move on today. Neither is it ready to move on tomorrow. You know, for, for in fact, let me, let me tell us something. As far as leadership is concerned, you can affirm that a country can be good 
from now to next 10 years by what the leadership are putting the leaderships are putting in place today i repeat you can affirm if country will be good in the next five years or ten years based on the based on the actions and inactions of the today's leader okay for instance in 1970s nigeria started nigeria airways uae started emirate the same time with nigeria airways now the administration of nigeria airways was started with tribalism people were fist not because they have knowledge of aviation industry people were employed not because they understand what aviation sector is all about but because they are for one section of the country and they were made directors and all this now in uae the same year emirates management we are done in partnership with americans emirates we are not interested on whether it's run by our citizens or not we want to get the best brands to manage this investment this business they saw it as business emirates now, Nigeria saw it as, they say, it's a public operation. Yes. You understand? One person saw it as a business. Another sees it as a freezer. They say it's a public operation. And guess what? From 1970s to today, Emirates has a stakeholder in aviation, international aviation industry, is competing with big giants among international aviation sector. Now, as where is your Nigeria Airways? Your Nigeria Airways is dead and buried. It's as simple as that. So when people come up and start talking rubbish from the poopy, that all say the Lord, come on. Do you think God is stupid like you? No, God is not. God is not. He is not irrational like you who, who profess illusions and fantasies. Walk without the uh, faith is dead. So when you look at Nigeria today, ask yourself just a simple question. What sector has Nigeria perfected? I just mentioned one sector in, our, in UAE, talking about Emirates. What about agriculture? What about tourism? In fact, we are, you know, Nigeria does not have more oil than UAE and most of them. Do you know that? That Nigeria does not have more oil in as in more oil than most countries of Middle East. Nigeria does not have more oil than them. But let me not tell you, because I always say to people, you don't just you don't just uh, think about a nation by illusion. Do you know Saudi Arabia as I speak to you? After this program, take time to Google it. Do you know that Saudi Arabia is building the highest tourism city in the world? Saudi Arabia. Because when people say Nigeria will be good better, uh, it will be good tomorrow, ask them what are the indices, what are the impulse today that you will say? Because if a man plans today, you will be optimistic for tomorrow's harvest. Am I correct? That is just the way life is. But it is only in this part of the world that nobody is planting today. Absolutely zero planting approach. And one idiot is saying they will bumper harvest tomorrow. 
nature absorbs that. If you look at education, let's just look at education so that you, you see, the more we analyze Nigeria for you, the more you start. Thank God for those of us in the struggle for self determination because we have already, we have already, uh, you know, built up a shock absorber. Yes, we have really built it up. But most of you who are just joining this program who are not too used to with this kind of analysis. By the time we keep on explaining Nigeria to you, you might want to commit suicide because you will understand how hopeless your, your Nigeria is. You understand how hopeless. I'm talking about most of them. And I thank God because most I realize most times even members of Nigeria Security Agency, uh, agents, agencies, I mean to say, listen to us. Members of DSS come here, uh, members of Nigeria military, they listen to police, and they get the truth. Yes, they might not like us based on the fact that they want to be politically correct, but the truth they gather here, they, you know, is not something you can say these guys are lying. It's all over the places. And I say, for instance, let's look, you know, uh, let's look at educational sector. As I speak to you, why the mess of Nigerian graphics, even during the lockdown, during the lockdown, we are studying via internet. They were having their classes through online classes. Because I can remember, I checked out for University of Haifa in Israel. Yes? For one or two programs and i discover they were distance learning online but guess what in nigeria the universities are shut down are you going to talk about online study when the internet is not even a solid one then now tell me why the world is moving in such a speed the government is encouraging a retrogressive speed. The world is moving left, I mean to the right. On a speed length, Nigeria is moving left on a speed then. The universities are closed. ASU, federal government negotiation on deadlock. And what do you expect? The students are just, some of them have turned massing, going to sites where they are building houses, missing cement and sand, doing all kinds of jobs. The girls who are tired staying at home are just lottering on the street, prostituting. Nothing happening. You can now understand what we are talking about. So when you understand such country, you should cry for yourself. Any day you say to yourself, you're in Nigeria. Because already your destiny is a crushed one. Your destiny is just a wrecked one. Because the country is just hijacked by few Criminals who don't even think about the common man on the street. And the one shocking thing about it is that why you are here giving them a temple, their children are overseas studying. You understand me? Their children are overseas studying. They are not observing the strike at home because they are on distance learning. When you are here tumbling up them, you will travel on the bad road and bandits go for bit. We kidnap you. And when them and their children are traveling, they evolve. In fact, if they get to nearby airports, they will refuse to use 
their motor case on a, di a short distance. They will even hire a chopper to fly them down to their compound, thereby not even thinking about you. So do you call that a country? It's never. It's just an estate. It's just an estate. Not a state. It is an estate owned by few criminals. It's hey, just the way it is. So apart from education, let's look at security sector. What is there in security sector? How much is paid to an average police officer, military officer, DSS? How much are, are they paid? Their uniforms they buy for themselves. For your information, most of them don't know. They are boots. They are kittens. They, they solve it by themselves. Sometimes some of them buy their bullets for themselves. They buy, yes. I've missed it. I've had some police officers complaining of buying bullets for themselves. And ask yourself, are those things budgeted for? Don't do policeman's uniform reflect on the budget? Ask yourself this question and go and find out. If yes, who is cornering those money? It is so sad that these guys are treated in this way and uh, when they are released to attack their fellow suffering citizens, they even do that with happiness. Or, or, uh, never mind, I will also understand the place of trauma when somebody is psychologically destroyed, mentally destroyed, and he's handling life so he can turn to a beast. But the truth remains, even the security sector, what is happening? They even turn the police as elite police, carrying bags to these guys, escorting their children. <laughs> and the children of the police officer is at home, no school. But the police officer is busy carrying life and the umbrella for the child of these guys who are impoverishing him and his children. You, you, you now understand how the country is. Agriculture, what is the fate of these farmers? Can the farmers assess their bushes, their farmland? Absolutely no. Not just only in their farmland, even in corn. Remember that North is the net producer of Nigerian food, local food consumption. And what is the fate of farmers now? That even farmers pay bandits before they go to their farms in North. And you tell me there is a government. If few individuals are now collecting tax from farmers, that means they have already established a government. If a farmer will not pay by a bandit before he goes to harvest or before he goes to plant, then what do you call a government then? It's a first state. But simply put, when the government is no longer effective, that country is failed. So you now understand. Now talk about infrastructure. Today we are still jumping on that, the Butre Road when countries are just working out of that, going to more sophisticated means of transportation. What are your rules like? Ask yourself. In fact, when you remember traveling from west to east or north to east, and you remember how bad the rules are and the level of terror on the rules, in fact, if you don't take time, you have a BP, you have a high running blood pressure. Because the roads are bad, terribly bad. And nobody's talking about it. Because these guys can afford to fly above 
the animals they kill. And that is just the way it is. So what are we talking about? The truth remains that Nigeria is a fell state. Policy of the Fulani reckless leader's actions. And we thank them for that because if they had never been like this, we would not, uh, perhaps, by now everybody will be jumping up and be saying Nigeria is a great nation. So this is where we'll come to for the uh, for tonight's uh, program because I'm I'm just beginning to have headache this person it just I can feel dance in my organ the deep of hopelessness and scary future without us praying for the end of this country or doing anything for the end of the country. It's really scary. Because those who say they are schooling, what is the, where is the work for them? Where is the work for them? So I feel depressed. I feel heartbroken. And I think at this moment, I have to come to the end of this program. So do enjoy yourself and stay strong.